All right. Welcome, everybody. Our speaker today is Dennis Bratzke from the University of Heidelberg. And he will talk about the gamma limit of four sharp interface model related to pattern formation on biomine membranes. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Armin, for the introduction. And welcome, everybody. Um, as Thank you very much for the invitation. And I'm very happy to be able to speak here and to be allowed to speak here. And uh, as Garmin, uh, Armin announced, I will talk about the gamma limit for a sharp interface model. And this is joint work with Hans Knüpfer and Anna Machiniak Chokra. And this is part of my PhD thesis. And uh, yeah, I just think I will start. Let me give you a brief overview. So for two parameters, gamma and epsilon and the unit flatoros, uh, usually of dimension bigger than one, and a function in BV, we will talk about this energy functional right here. By the way, can you see my mouse? Yes, yes, we can. Yes, OK, thank you. So um, I will talk about this energy functional right here, which consists of two parts. Uh, first, uh, this local term, which is uh, a short notation for the perimeter of the, of the function u, and a non-local term, which we'll talk about uh, throughout this talk in a minute. So first, I want to give you some motivation and uh, why we're talking about this uh, energy and its relation to a biological model. Afterwards, I want to talk about some results that uh, my collaborators and I were obtaining regarding the gamma limit of this functional. And then I want to go a little bit into the proofs and uh, work in progress uh, on these types of functionals. Okay, uh, every time I write this k epsilon, you can see here, you can always, for, for the simplification, we'll always talk about L1 dilations of k. So k epsilon is one over epsilon to the n of k of this fraction. Uh, just uh, as we jump through the slides. But in general, you can take whatever epsilon and have some additional assumptions, then everything works. But for simplification, we work with L1 dilates today. OK, let me introduce the topic. So first, um, as part of my PhD thesis, uh, I try to understand mechanochemical mechanisms on very, very small scales, uh, basically on scales of uh, tissues for biological organisms such as hydra, which you see in the first figure, or also even tinier cell membranes. Like this is on scales of micro to nanometers. And if you look at those models, most of them have a lot of parameters, a lot of uh, things you can change, parameters uh, which, which you can change, which give rise to very complex and complicated uh, structures and phenomena. However, in, in the project I'm involved in, we try to develop the simplest mathematical models to describe these uh, phenomena. And in particular, we try to understand mechanochemical pattern formation. So this is pattern formation on this membranes or tissues that arises due to mechanical and chemical effects that are involved in these systems. So possible example, as I was saying, is the regeneration processes in Hydra. For example, if you take a Hydra and cut it in half, then uh, at one point, uh, the Hydra starts to regenerate and it forms again heads and tail, even though you cut it in half. And this is due to mechanochemical pattern formation in the tissue of the Hydra. And another one is uh, lipid rafts. Uh, formation of lipid raft domains in cell membranes, which are believed to, uh, to be responsible for transmembrane signaling or immune responses and a lot of um, biological application here. So I want in particular motivate uh, to the motivation by the following experiments, which were done in the lab of uh, Groves and they they did the following. So what they did is they took a vesicle, like what you see here in, in figure A, and they adhered it to a solid substrate. And what is 
Now, uh, the vesicle, the vesicle is basically a membrane which consists of two chemical compounds. Uh, you can say there is white, corresponds to no cholesterol, and black is cholesterol. So basically two phases. And as you see, uh, from A, B, C, D, E, there is a time evolution and you go from these very thin and fine scale stripe patterns to these hexagonal arrays of, uh, of circular patterns. So you can see below that you have here where my mouse is now the stripe patterns and they evolve to these hexagonal patches of, of circular domains. And this is what corresponds to mechanical or what we believe is uh, the, let's say it another way, the response, uh, what is responsible for these pattern formation is mechanical um, interactions between the membrane and the chemicals involved. So um, basically we have this experiment, we observe, we have fine scale patterns, and now we have uh, to explain them. And we try to do this uh, by modeling. And uh, there was a model proposed by uh, Shimokawa, Komura, and Andelman uh, shortly after the experiments were done. And they proposed a mechanochemical model which uh, combines uh, local composition and local curvature. So every time I talk about composition, I mean the chemical compositions within the membrane. And every time I talk about the curvature, I'm talking about the uh, membrane itself. So first they said, okay, there is a chemical interaction. We see two phases. So we have some sort of phase separation. And this is why a kahn type energy, which you see in red, enters the overall energy, which we're trying to minimize. So we have a kahn type energy for the chemical substances. And then we have a mechanical interaction. And we model this by a Helfig type energy, which you can see here in blue. And you can basically think of the membrane as a height profile H. And the Laplace of H is a first order approximation of the curvature of this membrane. And this Helfrich type energy comes in into this Laplace squared and the coupling between phi and h. And uh, we are here on a sub on the uh, we are here on a solid substrate, which means we have surface tension as well, which you can see here in the uh, green color. And the surface tension corresponds to a gradient of, of H. So let me highlight this first order coupling right here, because um, this is where another physical assumption comes in uh, into this Helfrich type energy. But I just want to stress out, don't, don't think about too much about the modeling here. Um, it's basically, we have two compounds, a curvature and a, uh, and a chemical substance. And they are coupled via this term right here. Other, other than the coupling, which you can see here in magenta, um, there are basically two energies decoupled. OK, so uh, Kumura, Shimokawa, and Andelman, they proposed this energy model and said, uh, this is why pattern formation occurs. So when we go further into now the mathematics to it, um, we can do some simplifying assumptions. And first and foremost, we can remove the dependence on the variable H here and make this energy only uh, dependent on one function. And we can do this via the physical assumption that the elastic stress relaxes much faster than the typical time scale of diffusion, which basically means that the variation uh, in direction of h is zero. So you get an Euler-Lagrange equation, you can solve h in terms of u, and then you, uh, and, it, and that results in this new energy I, I, wrote, I wrote down here, in this fq epsilon. And again, this fq epsilon is basically a little massage on, on, on this Euler-Lagrange equation plugged into the equation. But um, what you see now is we removed one variable, but ended up with a non-local energy. Because uh, here, again, we have a kahn type energy. But here now, this uh, Helmholtz operator is inverted. So this is now a non-local operator right here. And uh, the parameters are now effective in the sense that they don't have any 
dimensions attached to it anymore. So epsilon can be seen as a reverse length scale and Q is basically a non-local interaction term. So Q is basic, basically a measure for how strong the coupling between uh, the chemical and the mechanical forces are. If we go back here, this lambda is uh, the coupling constant. And if you go now to the reduced ones, so if this lambda is very, very, very large, then Q approaches one. And if you see one is basically leading to a degeneracy of the diffuse interface part. So Q going to one means we have a very, very strong uh, coupling between the two um, variables here, which are chemical substance and height profile of the membrane. Okay, so here we have now an energy and uh, basically people did analysis on this energy and um, for us most relevant is uh, the paper by Fonseca, Heirapetian, Leoni and Zwicknagel where they showed gamma convergence of this um, functional right here. So what they showed is the following. In the limiting behavior epsilon to zero, and this is the uh, relevant one, and there exists a Q bar bigger than zero, such that if Q is smaller than this Q bar, we are gamma convergent to the perimeter uh, with a constant in front of it. And uh, this is good and bad news at the same time. The good news is uh, we have a gamma limit. And the bad news is uh, the gamma limit does not explain pattern formation. Just as a reminder, what we want to see is these um, stripe patterns or these hexagonal arrays of balls. But if we have as a gamma limit, the perimeter, which we can minimize, then this means that um, the minimization of the perimeter is just a single ball or a single stripe, depending on how much mass is in the system. And this is not a fine scale pattern. This is uh, distinctly not a fine scale pattern in that we don't have a length scale attached to where we have uh, the distance between balls or whatever. So this is uh, a little bit bad news, um, but this is fixable hopefully in the future. And another uh, drawback is that we do not have an explicit description of this Q bar, which we which is basically a critical parameter or the constant in front of the perimeter. So um, now we have this energy. We see, we find two regimes, basically a subcritical and a supercritical regime, where in the subcritical regime, which means Q smaller than Q bar, says, okay, there is no pattern formation. So at this stage, my analysis, my my project kicks in and says, okay, let us figure out what is what are the parameters involved? What can I compute this Q bar? Can I compute the C of Q? And can I maybe find a regime of parameters, especially parameter Q, for which I can uh, determine where pattern formation occurs or not? Uh, I see that someone raised a hand. Uh, please go ahead, just, just ask questions whenever. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dennis. So could you just uh, give me a little bit of a guide? So if, if I drop the last term from this reduced effective energy. You mean uh, the non-local term? Yeah, and, and, and let's just say set Q to be zero, uh, just to get that out of the way. Then that's the uh, Muller functional. Are you familiar uh, with Which one? It's, it's basically then a kahn hilliard type functional, right? But with the extra term, the minus u squared, this gives you a fine yeah. scale. So that's the, I think Muller, Stefan Muller was the first one to look at the gamma limit for that, the scaling limit for that. So that gives you periodic structures. There's, a, there's an interesting scaling there in the, the energy minimizers. So I, I, I guess I just wanted to understand how this non-local term perturbs that. Because you, okay. you indicate that um, the gamma limit is just the perimeter, but that's not that's not my recollection of the uh, the reduced model without the non-local part. Okay, maybe that helps you. If you look at the non-local term, if epsilon is very, very, very small, 
what you basically see is that this is the identity operator. So what you have is basically a difference of u squared minus u squared, which cancels out. So I in see. the limit epsilon oh. square epsilon to zero, this phenomenon is is cancelled. Does that yeah. help you? You know, it does. It does. So now I'm interested how you perturb that away to get good. So I'm I'm ready to hear the next part. <laughs> All right, and. Uh, the rest, if, if you have any questions, then, then just interrupt me at any point, okay? Thank you very much for the question. Okay, so what I was saying is my project kicks in here and we try to understand these parameters involved and the constants appearing, basically this Q bar and this C of Q. So um, just as a side note, this is now one parameter regime, we could have chosen different parameters, epsilon q and, and alpha, beta, whatever. We could introduce more parameters here, but we are choosing this single parameter um, uh, set uh, because it's, uh, it's <laughs> simple and complicated at the same time because it only involves one parameter, which is fixed. At this stage, it is q, and epsilon is going to zero. Um, OK. So this was the model which was analyzed so far and where we thought, okay, maybe we can contribute here. And uh, let me now say what model we are using. So we are not using a diffuse interface model anymore. We are going to the sharp interface model here. And what I mean by this is, uh, first of all, we, we fix the reference domain to be the torus, the flat torus, which is a periodic cube and, um, and I think everyone is, is uh, familiar with, with the flat torus here. Um, what we also did say is, a f is an assumption where we say, OK, we are not looking at the diffuse interface. We're looking at the sharp interface. And this is motivated by, by the experiments and by the pictures that we saw. Maybe I can go back to the picture here. If you look at the zoom ins, you can see that there is basically a sharp interface between white and black where we say, okay, at some scales, probably the diffuse interface does not have too much impact anymore. Let us go to the sharp interface model instead of the diffuse interface model, which is simpler. And let's see what we can do there. First, let us look at the sharp interface model. And this is uh, exactly what we did here. So we're not looking at Sobolev functions in H1 anymore, but at functions U in BV, uh, which have values in zero and one, basically sets. So, but if we go to the sharp interface model, we have to find a replacement for the kahn hilliard type energy. And this is what we do. Uh, we just um, replace the diffuse part by its gamma limit, which is also a sharp interface. So the theory of Monica Mortola says, if you have a uh, kahn hilliard type functional, as epsilon goes to zero, you end up with a perimeter of u. And what you can see here is uh, if, if you just factor this one over a one minus q, you can basically get another factor here, which, which I call gamma. And um, in gamma, so gamma is related to this, to this parameter q here. And if you do this, we have a resulting energy of the, of, of the kind I was presenting you in the beginning. So this term right here is now the kahn hilliard type energy, which is replaced by the sharp interface term. And this non-local interaction right here is, um, is uh, by the uh, non-local interaction we saw earlier. OK, yes, uh, I saw someone again raise his hand. Yeah, Dennis, thank you. So uh, thank you for talking so carefully through this. So yeah, for the gamma limit part there, don't you have to rescale an epsilon in order that you have an order one object? Uh, I, I, uh, what do you mean? Uh, oh, sorry, I see. I, 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 missed, I, I missed it. There is a one over epsilon in front of the integral. Ah, I you mean the this one right here? It's already there. I, I missed it. Okay, yeah. But the, but this is uh, already in the original functional, and, and I think mm -hmm. there is no yeah. problem going in. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, and this non-local operator right here is basically a convolution with, with a kernel with a fundamental solution here. And if we uh, 
massage this term and plug just in a VB function, we end up with this uh, energy right here, which is the one I presented you in the beginning. And for pattern formation uh, and the biological uh, model, we have K epsilon being the fundamental solution to the Helmholtz equation I, I am writing down here. So now we have a sharp interface version of our diffuse interface uh, diffuse interface model, and we can ask the same questions. So what we can do is we try to find the gamma limit as epsilon goes to zero when gamma is fixed. And when gamma is fixed, that also is related to Q being fixed. And if we find maybe uh, relations for gamma, we can translate them for relations to Q. So what we're trying to do now is gamma limit for epsilon to zero for fixed gamma under the constraint of prescribed volume fraction, which means the integral of, uh, of u is conserved. So at this stage, we also thought, um, I mean, having one kernel is good. And, and just for the uh, uh, for getting some sense of what this functional is doing. However, we thought, OK, maybe we can uh, also get more general kernels. And this is why from now on, we are using k epsilon for being a general kernel. And as I said, we try to identify critical parameters. And if we find a gamma limit, uh, can, we, um, can we explicitly compute them? And if so, how are they related to the original biological model? And these are uh, where our goals. And uh, yeah, from here on, I think uh, I stop with the introduction and go to the results. But before that, I want to ask, does anyone have any questions so far? OK, so then let me uh, go through the assumptions. So first, let me tell you about the admissible class. Uh, A consists of functions which are uh, in BV, which have fixed mass, uh, fixed L1, for, uh, L1 norm for a fixed uh, parameter theta. And also, we have now the following energy functional. This is the same energy function as before, but uh, for everything else, we, we're working basically in L1 instead of, instead of A uh, to have a vector norm uh, structure. For this, we say everything that's not in A, we just set it to plus infinity. So now let me give you some assumptions on the kernel. And again, please note that if if I write k epsilon, k epsilon is a dilation of one kernel k. Okay. And I'm talking now about this one kernel k, and I say uh, it has to satisfy three assumptions. So, first, it is radial, which means uh, that, uh, which you can see there. We also impose that the first moment is finite and something we call essential repulsive. K is essentially repulsive, which means no matter. Uh, uh, what I remove at the origin, the integral always stays positive. And with this at hand, we can define now this gamma crit. And spoiler alert, this will be the critical value for our uh, energy functional. But we can define this uh, now and see that it is finite, and uh, we will work with gamma crit from there on. You can, you can basically think of gamma crit as being the inverse of the first moment. moment. So let me give you a uh, quick remarks on these assumptions. So K being radial means in the model that there is no preferred direction of the non-local interaction, which is pretty standard in these types of models. Um, having the first moment being finite allows for gradient type estimates on, on the difference that you can see here, because if I just plug in one over Z times Z, you can see that we have here now, something which looks like the first moment, and here we have something which looks like a gradient or a difference quotient, which allows for gradient estimates. And K being essentially repulsive is uh, a less restrictive assumptions on something like the maximum principle. Because if, if, you, if you go back to, to this kernel right here. If I now take the Fourier transform and, and, and remove everything, uh, put everything on the right side, we see that the multiplier is positive and we see that we have a maximum principle. 
However, if we go to fourth order equations, then we don't have a maximum principle anymore. And this is related to the fact that there are negative uh, values in the fundamental solutions. Um, but our um, assumption, the essential repulsiveness, uh, includes some of those kernels, and in particular, combinations of Kelvin functions, which are fundament fundamental solutions to fourth order equations. So uh, we are not restricted to positive kernels, but the kernels can be at some points non negative as well, as long as these integrals uh, in the long range stay positive. And this is um, this is uh, good news because mo most of the literature deals with uh, non-negative kernels, which is fine, and for most applications, just just uh, a good assumption. Um, we relax this assumption, uh, and you can also see why uh, when I talk about the proofs, because uh, it comes in very very natural uh, with the idea we had for these kind of models. So. Um, to understand our result, let me just recall what gamma convergence means, because our, uh, and I was also talking about gamma convergence earlier, so let me just give you a quick rehab on what gamma convergence means for our setting. So uh, if uh, I have a family of functionals f epsilon and a limit function f, then we say f is the gamma limit of f epsilon if the following two conditions hold. First of all, we have the limb infinite quality. Um, which basically says that the function f is a lower bound for the family of function f epsilon. And we have a second condition, which is the limb sup inequality, which basically says that this lower bound is an optimal lower bound. This type of convergence was introduced by De Giorgi in his uh, 79 paper and uh, has huge applications and uh, very good properties. For example, gamma limits are always lower semi-continuous, which is very uh, appropriate for energy minimization and the techniques of the calculus of variations. And we also have information about minimizers of f epsilon because minimizers of f epsilon converge to minimizers of f, which means if we can solve the limit functional, if we can minimize the limit functional, then we know as epsilon approaches zero, the minimizers are also very close to the minimum of f. Okay, and just quick applications. Uh, we have microscopic to macroscopic. Uh, so th this is now uh, basically mathematicians saying this is rigorous, uh, having the passage from microscopic to macroscopic for discrete to continuous or diffuse to sharp interface situations. And for our cases, very relevant are, of course, microscopic to microscopic. So let me now present the main theorem. And uh, this is the following. So if we have uh, dimension bigger than one and assume that k satisfies the assumptions, then we have basically three main results. The first one is if the parameter gamma is smaller than gamma crit, then we have what we call compactness, which means if the energy is bounded, then we find a subsequence which converges. Then we also find that we have non-compactness if we are above the critical value, and even if it's equal to critical value. So uh, we cannot guarantee compactness anymore if we are above the critical value uh, for gamma bigger than gamma crit. Um, and in the subcritical regime, we can we found the, the gamma limit, which is just a perimeter again. Um, and you can see that um, here, the energy functional, uh, the limit functional is just the perimeter, just with a constant in front of it. But the minimization problem stays the same. It's just a constant in front of it. One question, just to clarify. Yes. In this gamma convergence, you, stay, you can be equal to gamma crit, but you don't have compactness. Exactly, yeah. So gamma equals to gamma crit is also uh, done here, uh, but you're losing compactness, exactly. And you can see that you're not gaining information about uh, in the critical regime. If gamma equals to gamma crit, then the gamma limit is just zero. And um, zero is minimized by, by a lot of, lot of stuff. <laughs> so. so this is uh, exactly. So if if 
gamma equals gamma grid, we can find the gamma limit, but it does not give us any information. Um, and this is where we go to higher order gamma limits, where we do renormalization and, and see if higher order effects play a role. But I will comment on that later. Okay, so this is the main result. Basically, we know when we have in this parameter regime compactness and non-compactness, and in the subcritical regime, we have gamma convergence. In the supercritical regime, we don't have gamma convergence, but I will tell you about this in a minute. So let me just give you some related literature here. So um, we are far from the first ones to have uh, these non-local isoperimetric problems in our studies. And uh, there, there is a vast literature about these. Um, so let me just pick a few which are very uh, important and I think are very uh, well related to our situation here. So for the full space problem, uh, the gamma limit was also uh, established under slightly more restrictive assumptions on the kernel K. And the slightly more restrictive assumptions is that K by, uh, at their paper is assumed to be non-negative uh, while we allowed uh, also negative values. However, their analysis goes further and also talks about stability of minimizers. And um, if we uh, compare uh, the results there, uh, we recover the same gamma limits, which is uh, a good confirmation, <laughs> let's say the least. So there are also um, different types of uh, kernels you can use with different boundary conditions. And for the Helmholtz kernels, which are very relevant, there was this paper by uh, Mele and Wu, who showed that you have gamma limit for fractional Helmholtz kernels, and they also exploit some different uh, scalings and uh, fractional Helmholtz kernels, which is uh, pretty impressive. And also, I want to highlight one of the um, papers by my supervisor Hans Knüpfer and Ben Hui Shi, who derived gamma limits uh, of a similar problem. They are not having the same assumptions on the kernel K, but um, they have uh, the difference of two terms with different scaling. However, they use the sim similar techniques uh, than, uh, as, as we do here, basically the autocorrelation function. I will tell you what it is in a minute. And um, they were successfully using it to derive gamma limits for a different class of kernels. And of course, uh, about these non-local terms, uh, you cannot uh, skip Borgan Brzezis Mironescu, or in our case, uh, Davia, who was already considering these quantities. And our non-local term is a periodic version of the quantity considered by those authors. However, um, Again, we have a different uh, hypothesis here on the kernel kappa uh, on the kernel k, which is uh, not uh, which allows for negative values. So, uh, also in Burgan, Brzezis, Mironescu, and uh, Davia, we have non-negativity of the kernels, which we can relax in our studies here. And there, uh, again, and there are a lot of more related literature. I was just picking some of them, which I think are very important uh, for these types of questions we are asking. Okay, let me quickly uh, also discuss our results before I go into the analysis. So the results, I, I say it here again, we have compactness, non-compactness, and gamma convergence. And what we find is that we have two regimes, basically a subcritical regime and a supercritical regime, and that the limit problem can be solved explicitly in the subcritical regime. Um, however, the minimizers are given by a single ball or a single stripe, depending on the mass. And this means, again, we have no fine scale pattern formations if we are uh, looking for the biological application here. What is also a little unfortunate is that we do not have a comparison between the critical parameter gamma crit uh, and Q bar from the paper I was mentioning earlier by Fonseca, Herapetian, Leoni, and Signagel. Um, going to the sharp interface limit uh, is not enough to, uh, so, so there is no direct comparison of the sharp and diffuse interface limit. Um, the sharp interface limit seems to be uh, simplification and too much of a simplification in that. Um, 
I will not go into details how we show that this is possible, but basically, if we assume that the critical parameters in both models are the same, then uh, this Q bar from the Fonseca et al. paper has to be negative, which contradicts their um, main result. Okay, and a little bit to the supercritical regime. So in the supercritical regime, we know that multiple phases are preferred and we can construct a sequence u epsilon such that the energy is unbounded as epsilon goes to zero, which means in the supercritical regime, we cannot find the gamma limit anymore. Uh, in the supercritical regime, we mean gamma strictly bigger than gamma crit. And uh, yeah, for any such sequence that is uh, converging to minus infinity in the energy, the perimeter, so the it goes also it goes to infinity, which means there's no chance of knowing anything about minimizers. So the supercritical regime is very interesting uh, and is still a matter of research uh, by us. So um, yeah, today I want to talk about a little bit uh, of the analysis of the supercritical regime. Uh, I, I will go now into the proofs, but I want to ask again: Are there any questions? Can I? Uh, okay. If not, then let me go a little bit into the analysis. And uh, don't worry, it's it's not too much and it's not too hard, in my opinion. Um, let me tell you first about mathematical challenges. So first, we have a difference of two positive terms with the same scaling. And what I mean by this is, if I rescale from U to uh, if if I rescale the function, which you can see here. I just uh, get a constant in front here and a dilation of, of epsilon here. So which means um, there are finer phenomenon going on. And this also means, by the way, that the critical value gamma crit is independent of, uh, of the reference domain of this torus. So no matter how large I, I choose the torus, this is the gamma crit is independent of, of this length. So we can rescale everything to uh, the unit flat torus. And now we have the difference of two positive terms, which um, always is very hard in the calculus of variations. So of course, a non-local quantity is involved, which means that uh, we have to use very sophisticated method methods. Cutoff arguments are not working as they should, uh, as they do in local energies. And uh, on top of that, we have two competing um, phenomena going on. The local term, which is in red, that prefers concentration in the sense that we want to have one single ball or one single stripe. We're not trying to, um, to split the set in which, we are, in which we are to minimize the energy. So the local term prefers to be connected and to be uh, either a ball or a stripe. However, the non-local term prefers oscillations, multiple phases, because we have an, a minus sign in front of it. So here we have two competing uh, effects to minimize the energy. So our idea, which uh, was also exploited in, in the paper by Knüpfer and Schill, is to use something we call the uh, autocorrelation function. And the autocorrelation function is basically a mean value of the convolution with, with the function itself. So the correlation function, capital C u, is nothing more than the convolution of u with itself. And the symmetrized autocorrelation function is just the mean value in all directions. So I will show you in a minute how this is useful, but let me just tell you that this autocorrelation function has a lot, lot of useful properties. So the first one is we have uh, estimates in terms of uh, uh, the autocorrelation function itself. So we know that it's always bigger than zero and always smaller than its mass, which is very neat. We also know that both autocorrelation functions are Lipschitz continuous, and we know the Lipschitz constant exactly. And in the case of the symmetrized autocorrelation function, we know that it is given by the perimeter of u times a constant, which is dependent on dimension, which is also very nice to know. Also, um, this autocorrelation function in general can be very, very irregular. 
near the origin, for example, Lipschitz, Lipschitz regularity is guaranteed. However, um, if you go one uh, one more, if, if you take one more derivative, you have uh, a priori no information. So, uh, but what we were able to show is that if you have a polygon, then this uh, autocorrelation function is a polynomial of degree n near the origin, which is also very nice because that means that the autocorrelation function near the origin is very, very smooth. So how do we introduce your autocorrelation function in our model here? So here I have the non-local term and we can now exploit the fact that we're in the sharp interface model, which means uh, this absolute value right here can only take the values uh, zero and one. So it's also the same as it is squared, but now I can do binomial formula. And what I end up with is basically the following. Um, I just integrate the kernel with respect to this autocorrelation function here. So this is nothing more than the L2 norm or in our case, the L1 norm, and this is the non-local interaction. And it's, it's basically a convolution with itself, as I was saying earlier. And now we can exploit, uh, we can go to uh, polar coordinates, to spherical coordinates, to arrive at this one-dimensional integral here. So, um, and here we see that this capital C uh, is symmetrized and goes to this symmetrized version of of the autocorrelation function. So now um, we are looking at this and, and we are seeing, okay, here we have something like a difference of two terms. This looks like, uh, again, a little bit like a, a derivative, like a difference quotient. So what we want to do here is now doing an integration by parts to arrive at the derivative of the autocorrelation function. Remember, we have, here very nice uh, properties of the autocorrelation function. And we have good information about the first derivative in terms of the perimeter, which is very neat. And not at all um, <laughs> for granted, basically. So what we have here is, or what we want to do here is we go, we want to go to the first derivative of the autocorrelation function because we have good information about the autocorrelation function uh, of the first derivative of the autocorrelation function. Okay, and how do we do this? Okay, this is basically straightforward. We take this integral kernel right here and want to take the antiderivative of it. And this is what you see here. Oh, sorry. This is what you see here uh, with this capital phi. And this capital phi now has the following properties. Capital phi itself is non-negative. And this is given by the uh, essential repulsiveness. So here, um, this is basically, uh, the essential repulsiveness is saying basically that the integrated kernel is non-negative. And the derivative is as we want for the integration by parts given by the kernel. You can do a little bit of analysis and see that these limits are zero, which means the boundary terms are vanishing. And you can also compute uh, the moment uh, that the moment is the L1 norm of the integrated kernel. And after an integration by parts, this leads to the following. The non-local term can be now rewritten in terms of phi, the integrated kernel, and the autocorrelation function, the derivative of the autocorrelation function. So, and this is very, very good because now we can reformulate the energy and it looks like this. So what you see here is basically you have a weight which is the integrated kernel. And you have this difference of two terms again. So now this C prime U of zero, this is the local term. This is the perimeter term, just rewritten as the autocorrelation function. And this now is the non-local term as we just saw, uh, as we just um, uh, did uh, the mathematics here. But this reformulation has now uh, good insights. So the first thing is, although the energy is not linear in U, it is linear in terms of the autocorrelation function, which is a structure you, uh, we, we did not see first. So when we did the analysis, uh, we saw, okay, wow, this is linear in terms of this CU. The next thing is phi epsilon is a Dirac sequence, which means that the limiting behavior of this energy 
is only dependent for epsilon to zero on uh, the autocorrelation function near zero. So if, if we do like formal computations, uh, what we would do is phi epsilon now converges to C prime u of u zero minus C prime u of zero. And of course, with the, with the corresponding uh, constants in front of it. So this is very neat. Then we have good estimates on the autocorrelation function. And this in turn implies we have a lower bound. And uh, the lower bound is given just by the perimeter. If we just say C prime of u of r is bigger than C prime of zero, then the integral goes away. And we see that this very neat uh, inequality holds. And But on the other hand, if we go to polytopes, which we know are smooth, we can do the formal calculation. Then they are rigorous because we are smooth enough. And we can show that, well, we, for, we, I, we have this lower bound, but we also are optimal because we're converging as epsilon goes to zero. So here we are basically done in the subcritical regime because in the subcritical regime, we see here that we have a lower bound. And for polytopes, this is also optimal. And now for the gamma convergence, we just have to use an approximation argument, which says that every shape in BV can be approximated by polytopes. And this is how we get the limb sup inequality, because the limb inf inequality is basically uh, yeah, gifted to us by this uh, pointwise inequality. And this concludes the compactness and gamma convergence in the subcritical regime just by noticing, uh, but, but just by exploiting these, uh, the autocorrelation function here in this new formulation. Sorry, why does this conclude compactness? Um, because what you have here is uh, E gamma zero. And if you say, um, if your energy is bounded in epsilon, then so is E gamma zero, which is just a perimeter. And you know that the perimeter is compact in BB. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is um, now ba basically the idea and, and, and all of the proofs. Of course, there's a little bit more detail to it, but uh, the, the technical details are, are very, very, very minor. And for the supercritical regime, um, just note that E gamma zero is smaller than zero for gamma bigger than gamma crit. And so what you can do is you can always construct like more, uh, more laminates, basically an oscillating phase that uh, gives you that you are non-compact. And you can also use this to construct a sequence which, uh, construct a sequence which makes the energy being um, unbounded from below. Um, yeah, but, but this is mostly minor te technical details. And, and, and that's uh, for the proofs. So in the interest of time, let me just give you some work in progress before, uh, before I will end here. So what we are trying to do now is we uh, try to analyze the critical regime. So if gamma equals to gamma crit, then we know the gamma limit is zero. So what we could do is uh, renormalize the whole energy. So basically, for example, dividing by epsilon the whole energy and see if we have a higher order, uh, if we can, again, derive a gamma limit where we say that this is now a higher order gamma limit. Basically, a Taylor expansion in epsilon for, uh, for the energy function. What we can also try, uh, what we're also trying now is try to have different scalings. I was telling you in the beginning that, um, let me just skip here, that this moment condition uh, gives rise to gradient estimates. But what happens if we now say that we uh, are not taking z, but z to some power s, where s is between 0 and 1, and exploit, maybe we get different uh, gamma limits, which are dependent on s perimeters, for example. There, um, also, this paper um, by Mele and Wu, where they also have fractional Helmholtz kernels, they also were showing that uh, different scalings uh, and different moment conditions 
have impact on the type of perimeter which you're ending up with. So, oh, sorry. Um, and there are also different renormalization connected to these um, types of questions. And also with this autocorrelation function, we can maybe try to exploit uh, different symmetries because maybe, maybe I can show you here the, um, the mean value, the symmetrized autocorrelation function is here, the sphere, but the sphere com comes only into place when we go from the physical setting to the polar coordinate setting. To the spherical setting. So maybe instead of using spherical coordinates, we can use the co-area formula to have different sim underlying symmetries, which maybe um, we are suspecting uh, are going to uh, non uh, anisotropic uh, perimeter functionals. But this is also under investigation now. And as you can also uh, imagine here on the pictures, we're also doing simulations for the, for the biological model. This is now joint work with Alexey Kazanikov, who is also a postdoc, uh, who is a postdoc at the Institute of Math uh, Applied Mathematics in Heidelberg. And uh, basically what we're trying to do is, as we saw in the analysis, the sharp interface model and the diffuse interface model are not related uh, exactly with one another. So here we, uh, try to find now the parameters numerically before we uh, go into the analysis of trying to find the real critical values. So, and on the right, you see some of the simulations and it gets weird and it's very, very uh, hard to do. But uh, yeah, I, I'm very hopeful that we will find something. Okay, with this, uh, I thank you for your attention. All right, thank you very much.